welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Anna, and I'm here with my two friends, Ant and Will. Hello. Hello. Uh, Any corrections this week, chaps? I've not received anything, so... None on my side. Great, flawless as usual. (laughs) 100% accuracy (laughs) from last week. Good. (laughs) So we'll just dive right in. Um, This week we're talking about the year 1649. So the random number generator has blessed us with a year that's only two (laughs) decades after one of our last podcasts. So I hope everyone has remembered everything from 1629, because you never know what might come up. Uh, I would like each of us to give our three-word preview of what we're discussing today. Ant, your three words. Swedish, painting, theft. Ooh, the very Thomas Crown affair. It is the base of the Thomas Crown affair. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> Will, your words. No British kings. <laughs> <laughs> First time for everything. Uh, my three words are malignant sorcerer uprising. Ooh, I went through one of those. <laughs> I really wish I said the Thomas Crown Affair for mine there. (laughs) Uh, We're just going to add it to the list of movies that we need to watch together. Uh, All right. Well, that being said, let's kick off 1649. So for 1649, I have chosen the topic that is Swedish troops vacate Prague. Mm. So you're probably thinking... uh, Why were there Swedish troops in Prague in the first place? And the answer, as with pretty much everything about this time, uh, religion, but this time peppered with bits of art pilfering and theft. Uh, To set the scene, we need to realise that 1649 is the end of the Thirty Years' War, and in fact, the vacation of Prague, uh, which actually makes sounds very good. Yeah, (laughs) I've I've been on a vacation of Prague. It was nice. Uh, For a stag do. Uh, But this is the the last act of the Thirty Years' War. Um, This beggars the question, follow up. Pray tell, Ant, what is the Thirty Years' War other than just a war that lasted 30 years? And how, if any way, is it related to the Eighty Years' War, which is very similar, but nearly three times as long? Or the Hundred Years' War. Or the Hundred Years' War. Wow, there's a lot of wars. Or the Seven Years' War. What was it called on year 28? I think it, <laughs> I think it was called the indefinite war, uh, <laughs> the never-ending war. Um, so uh, it, it's actually a very significant war. It's a very significant multi-state war within Europe, engulfed the whole continent, and was actually one of the most destructive of all wars of all time. Uh, it's estimated that between 4.5 and 8 million soldiers and civilians died Jeez. during the Thirty Year War. Yeah, it's a pretty big deal. That's not just from direct warfare, but also from famine, internal displacement, uh, you know, and the sort of the, the things that this subsequently follow warfare. I mean, yeah, and if you think about the population at the time, yes. that's massive. It is absolutely massive. And wow. it, it was so bad that it reduced some populace uh, to 50% of the, the whole state was, 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 was died because of the Thirty Years' War. Wow. Um, you know, it was it was a real milestone actually in European history. Uh, it marks the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire. It, uh, you know, as any form of significant power, it was the end of the Protestant Reformation, of which this whole thing kicked out off over, and saw the rise of France um, in the sort of political state of Europe. And also, it was kind of um, international politicking and negotiations became more normalised, and it sort of sets the scene for modern politics in, in Europe as we know it, hmm. of like these states uh, negotiating and interacting with, at a state level, other than just as the king to another household or, or, or the church was. Sorry, is there a conspiracy involved? In the <clears throat> oh, <laughs> just you wait. <laughs> where, are the, where are the Medici's? And oh, all the Medici's, <laughs> they can definitely be sourced behind this. Um, but, but they did really cram in a lot in the 30 years, I think. Um, and it's actually very hard to talk about in any sort of um, uh, structured way, because if you looked at just a Gantt chart of all the states that existed <laughs> and didn't exist and their participation, in the sides they're in over time. It's just quinoa it, conspiracies it, all the way it's, through. It's just <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Um, but the first embers of the 30-year war Ooh. prior to this, roughly 30 years beforehand, um, was fanned uh, by the peace treaty called the Peace of Asperg um, or Augsburg. Yeah, Augsburg. probably Augsburg. Augsburg. Augsburg, maybe. Um, anyway, this was just... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Asburg. This was to settle religious disputes because uh, the Catholic Habsburgs were the ruling class and their Protestant princes in the, you know, the states of Germany uh, inside the Holy Roman Empire. They were bickering. Uh, Protestants were fighting for legitimacy. And uh, so they came eventually to this peace treaty and they established that the Holy Roman Empire could be divided into two religions, Lutheran and Catholic. 
and it also allowed any local prince or duke or ruler uh, to determine what religion their fiefdom was and in turn to be able to kick out any people of any other religion that wasn't their own from cool. that thing. So so this is, this is a really great idea and it was supposed to make everyone happy. Uh, <laughs> turns out most people weren't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huh. They had you to can leave. be one of two things and if not, you're out. Yeah, shocking I, I, that that didn't please everyone. It really did upset anyone as well that wasn't in one of those two camps. Say, I don't know, the Calvinists maybe? Mm, um, those guys. H- hold on to that thought because this does come uh, come around again later when the Calvinists are not happy. Um, this has also really not helped the whole starting of the war, the Thirty Years' War, was a slight hiccup of the peace treaty when a, a bunch of Protestants came to Prague to ask why they weren't allowed to establish a church in their Catholic rulers' uh, lands. And instead of like hearing them out in the council and that kind of stuff, they decided to uh, just uh, chuck them out a window. Okay. And uh, they fell uh, 70 feet uh, to, the, to the pavement below. And this is known as the defenestration of Prague, yeah. where we get the word <laughs> defenestration Defen- from. Defenestration. Defenestration. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I've it's just a-, a great word. I want to make sure everyone knows it. Uh, this is actually the third defenestration of Prague. It happened two times prior to this. Uh, <laughs> the first in 1419, um, when the city council, they really messed up a prisoner exchange. They killed like, the captives and that kind of stuff. And then the peasants revolted and chucked a bunch of people out the window. I'm not sure defenestrating thing, people or things is something that a state gets to apply like an ordered number to like that. Like, yeah. I, I can throw, <laughs> I think it's up to people what they throw out of a window at what time. This well, isn't the f- it's just like how notable were the defenestrations right? that they became numbered, like right? Like the first yeah. one and yeah. the second oh one. Oh my God, we're in, we're in Prague's <laughs> great defenestration era. Well, if it was the third time, you probably would like, which one did you mean? The t- this time and the one yeah, time yeah. two hundred years before? Maybe at some point you put some locks on a window. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Another time happened in 1483. More councillors got chucked out the window, this time because there was a coup. Is this the same window? I, 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 it might actually <laughs> be the same it's window. just the one. And yeah. if you ever get called to city council business in Prague, just avoid anything above the ground floor. Yeah. Um, but what actually happened is they got chucked out the 70 foot window and they survived. Oh. And people thought this was a sign from God. Sure. Other historians think it's because there's a massive pile of manure that they landed in, uh, but they, did, they didn't die, actually. But it, did, it was a massive insult. Um, so after this piece of uh, Augsburg, Asburg, in 1619, there were two groups that kicked off the fighting first in this sort of local, um, sort of religious part of the fighting. And this is the Catholics, ha- Habsburgs, and the Bohemian Protestants. Mm. But it rapidly grew from there. And... Uh, when we talk about the Thirty Years' War, we kind of talk about it in four phases. So I'm going to talk to you through the phases briefly. We're going to focus on the Swedish element of it, obviously, because that is the most important part, according to this year. <laughs> um, but it broadly divided into sort of religious wars and then suddenly becomes the sort of state-backed warfare. Um, the first phase is the Bohemian phase. It's local disputes based on religious ideology, Habsburgs versus uh, Bohemians. The Habsburgs are the ruling class and, the, and they absolutely dominate. Um, and so they just crushed this Bohemian revolt, and it's Catholics one, Protestants zero at this stage. Uh, the Did the Bohemians get crushed because all of their loose scarves got caught in the machinery <laughs> of war? And they're they, sort of like flowy caftans. They're, they're, were... <laughs> they're high ankled jeans, yeah. you know, which is not yeah, good they're, battle wear. They're slouchy bags <laughs> that didn't have enough weapons in them. Yeah, all those thin cigarettes they smoked. <laughs> Um, that's exactly what happened. Okay. But And then who comes to the rescue? But uh, the Lutheran state of uh, Denmark and the Danish king decides to get stuck in and help his uh, his Protestant brethren. Um, and from one of the books that I saw and read, it said, uh, I quote, a colossal failure. Oops. <laughs> uh, Denmark had to retreat and they sort of lost their sort of place in the sort of power struggle for a long while. And an army of mercenaries, you know, biting at their, their heels all the way back into Denmark. So at this stage now, Catholics are, two and Protestants are zero. And so this is where the, the war actually transitions from not just a religious backed, uh, you know, religious fighting, but to a state backed because Denmark and Sweden uh, were quite close and oh. they were implored for help. And this is where uh, there, there are also a lot of Calvinists. So they're worried about this Catholic hegemony growing and not having a place at the table, not having a legitimate religion inside this empire. So Gustavus Adolphus, who was the king of Sweden, uh, was on the side of the Lutherans, and he was a Lutheran himself. And he's actually been classed as the father of modern warfare. So when we think of warfare today, we think of this sort of manoeuvrist approach where speed, surprise, you know, all these kind of elements of warfare actually sort of started with him. Prior to him, there was lots of uh, heavy artillery in terms of cannons. Things were like, you know, uh, stayed, and there was very much a, uh, you know, 
uh, sort of structured how he did battle. And what he did is he tore up the rule books because he reduced the size of his cannons. So they were much, much lighter and therefore you could manoeuvre them more quickly. So rather than just having them high ground, you could then push them around and do counterattacks with them. Did he do a lot of flat packing of the cannons? <laughs> this is exactly it was. It was the, the little Allen key yeah. comes from this guy. It used to be called the Adolphus key. Um, <laughs> But he also uh, had a strong preference for muskets. So where others was like, no, we need to keep the sword forefront of this thing. He was like, fuck it, give everyone a musket. Yeah, not clanging. Um, it, <laughs> so much clanging as we know as swords clang. Um, it's pretty unsporting, really, muskets for, versus swords. Yeah. I mean, that's is this the origin of don't bring a knife to a gunfight? This is pretty much exactly the origin <laughs> yeah. of it. He, he brought the guns always to the knife fight. Okay. Um, this, something really interesting happened at this stage, though. So France, at the time, was a Catholic country, had a Catholic king. It was very, very Catholic. Um, but they started funding the Swedes. So they started who were fund, Lutheran. Who were Lutherans. Okay. So this is why the war transitioned from one of religion to one of politics. Huh. They didn't want a resurgent, dominant Holy Roman Empire right at the doorstep. Mm. And so they wanted to, to, to keep them down. This is the, this, the start of like politicking uh, within Europe where you chose sides not based on um, religious interests, but on national self-interest. Um, and it was actually Cardinal Richelieu, who's a very interesting man in, in history, who was a Catholic cardinal himself, was actually helping uh, in advising and paying the Swedes. And he also sponsored proxy wars and sort of discontent and fermented like uh, workers' revol revolts and stuff within the empire to further destabilize and, you know, continue this warfare by other means in, in, in the state um, just to kind of keep them down. So the next stage of this, after after Adolphus, you know, he had massive success. He sweeped through the, the Holy Roman Empire, down through Germany. Um, he was killed in battle in 1632. Yeah. And then as a result, the kind of like the Swedish sort of um, coherence sort of fell apart a little bit. And they kind of just kind of stayed where they were. The funding, they, they then were out of the war for a lot. And it actually switched, whereby the French then seeing this started decided to get stuck in. And it was the Swedes then sending money to the French. And the French then joining in uh, in the fight. Um, this phase, the French phase, actually is considered the bloodiest and most confused by far um, because states were switching sides, people were attacking their former allies. You know, there's a lot of confusion in this fog of war that lasted for a while. It was like a horrendous place to live in Europe at this time. Um, it ended in a treaty. Uh, we know this because it was the 30-year war and not the perpetual war that's continuing to this day. <laughs> the ongoing war. <laughs> we haven't been uh, conscripted into the, you know, the, the, Habsburgian, the Habsburgian yeah, exactly. army. Um, the treaty itself was called the, the Peace of Westphalia. It sure was. Uh, where they all came along with basically their maps of who they thought owned land and who they thought were on each other's sides and were very surprised. It's kind of like that Spider-Man meme when they all thought they were on different <laughs> sides and stuff. Um, and they, uh, they, they tried to negotiate what the next, what the peace should look like. Um, so the uh, the main point of the treaty, really, that, that fell out from this is that Netherlands and Sweden became independent. The Calvinism became a recognized religion. France gained a lot of ground, both literally and sort of like politically. And the Holy Roman Empire was just d devastated and mm. vastly weakened, not from just loss of population, but loss of power as well. So this this, lacked, this last act of negotiations were happening. The war was still continuing at, at some drips and drabs. And the last act was in Prague in 1648, whereby the Swedes had encamped after rushing into into Prague with, you know, daring night raves. You know, they did things a cover of darkness. And so that night raves? Or night, night... night raids, sorry, oh. raids. But okay. can we assume that there were also some night raves? <laughs> yeah, of course daring yeah. night raves. I mean, it's Prague, so. Yeah. K-N-I-G-H-T <laughs> raves. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to glow stick when you're wearing a full suit of armor. I mean, anything about the ground floor is pretty daring. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but one of the reasons that they went in there as well is not just to take Prague, uh, but because there's a lot of art and loot there as well. And they mm. knew that there's very oh. lots of you know, epicenter of lots Bohemia, of right? So they could, they, all, the, all the bongs they could take, no, no, no whatever. <laughs> um, but they tried to cross from the west over to the east in the river over to what's called Charles Bridge, which you can still still stand today and you can go and see it. But there was fierce, fierce resistance by the, the, the local populace. There's extremely uh, daring do's happening. And they repelled the Swedish. And <laughs> It's, it's actually, yeah, no, it, is, it is quite famous. No, I know. It's just great to, to think about extreme daring do's yeah. as a... There's a lot of detail a, I'm glossing over here. No, but it's just not it's, often said in that plural. Yeah, it's just yeah, quite, yeah. yeah daring's do. Daring's do, yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but they, 
they they repelled the Swedish and kept them on the the western bank, um, uh, and so the Swedes nobly uh, packed up and left without. Uh, oh wait, no, there was uh, what's called a sacking of Prague. <laughs> ah, dang it! <laughs> got, <us. laughs> got you guys, uh, zinger. They looted the palaces, castles, monasteries, um, and they think that was basically the historians think that's basically their intent all along. Um, and some of these works are still on display in Sweden. Ooh, yeah. So they haven't returned them, Tricky. and they're all across different. You know, as they've got sold and stuff all across different museums um, statues by Adrian de Veers the Orleans collection and many of Rudolf Ernst paintings about 472 significant artifacts um, that are on display in museums across the world are sourced from the sacking so, the Swedes have kind of they're kind of cheating aren't they because oh yeah. they they've spent hundreds of years being incredibly imperialistic and going around looting everyone next to them and then put on this invis- invincibility cloak of mm. neutrality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, we're neutral now, you can't touch us. It's like, yeah, yeah we've got all that stuff. Oh, right. <laughs> you know what would be a really back? great way to just totally punk them? Go into those museums, take all the art and throw it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> the demonstration yeah, yeah. of the Louvre or whatever. Just keep going, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, after the peace treaty, the news of them reached them. They sort of reluctantly gave up and they packed up and marched away, leaving a devastated mess behind in Prague. So this is uh, this is you know hist- historically significant because the uh, old city is obviously much older because the new one was was ransacked by them. Um, and this ended the Thirty Years' War, um, which is very significant. Ended the Reformation uh, and is the last major religious war in Europe, and it uh, genuinely changed the political landscape forever. Uh, wow. In Europe. So that's pretty uh, cool. Nice. Thanks. Thanks. That Sweden. is, I mean, I, I remember learning about the 30 Years' War in history, and I can tell you that the only thing I really remember is the Peace of Westphalia. So it's nice <laughs> <laughs> to get a little more context of it from that, uh, from that story. You're welcome. Daring do. Daring do's. You daring did it. I daring did it. <laughs> Daring's did it. <laughs> you, dare, you daring's did it. So Anna, what did you learn? Uh, I also went for war. Um, Good. Ha- turns out there's a lot of it at the time. Uh, and I'm in the Philippines, which I will confess I know absolutely nothing about. Mm. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing how little I know about it. Uh, there's obviously hundreds of years of history to cover, but I'm just going to start uh, with Spanish colonialism, which uh, was from 1565 until 1821. So the Philippines are governed by the Spanish. But interestingly, the, they're overseen by the vo- vice royalty of New Spain in Mexico, presumably for time zone reasons. Easier, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah easier yeah. to no run to the Philippines you know, from Mexico. All their VTCs were clashing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, so in the Philippines, there is a Spanish policy called polo y servicio, which is a system of forced labor. So all Filipino men between the ages of 16 and 60 would have to go on these work assignments for 40 days at a time. Uh, The jobs could be anything. There was a lot of shipbuilding, construction, clearing of forests and laying roads. Uh, The work was often very hazardous. But, you know, if you're just using forced labor, you actually don't care about that. Uh, No health and safety. Yeah, exactly. Not a lot of health health and safety. Nary a high-vis jacket to be seen. (laughs) Um, And you could pay your way out of it. But, of course, the payment was extremely high and well beyond the means of uh, most people on the islands. So um, an interesting part of the Polo y Servicio scheme was that the men were supposed to only have to do their polo near their hometowns. Mm -hmm. Um, So at least they weren't having to travel to these far-flung islands. Polo y Servicio. Yeah. That does... No, not polo e cerveza. No, not which would polo be chicken e and cerveza. Beer. Well, that would be that would be in fact pollo e cerveza. Pollo e ch- yeah, cerveza. this is polo um, and servicio. So, like, yeah, work and service. I think. Um, uh, so, anyway, that the rule that they don't have to do it outside of their hometowns very quickly goes out the window. It <laughs> defenestrated, <laughs> we might say, um, and so these men are sent all over the Philippines, which are an island nation. So it's hazardous to get from one island to another, far, far away from their homelands. This unsurprisingly makes people very mad. And because of this and other things, there are lots of rebellions uh, from the sort of native Filipinos against the Spanish over this several hundred year period of Spanish colonialism. There's basically a major uprising every 20 or 30 years so sort of every generation gets really mad about what's happening to them Makes sense. yeah can't blame them uh but today of course we're talking about the one that kicked off in 1649 
in what is today the town of Palapag on the island of Samar. Um, our main character is a man named Agustin Sumaroy, who was a member of the Ware people who are native to Samar. And uh, Sumeroy was kind of a notable on his island. He was he had some sort of position of power amongst the the people in his in his town. But on Samar, in particular, the local mayors were disregarding the no faraway service rule, and they were sending men all the way to the shipyards of Manila, which was on the complete other side of the country. Very hazardous work to be done, very dangerous voyage to get there. Everyone's mad about it, but Sumeroy decides to do something about it along with two associates, Don Juan Ponce and Don Pedro Camug. And the three of them start to sort of foment some of this opposition to the Spanish. They rouse men from neighboring towns. They start skirmishing with the Spanish soldiers who are garrisoned there. The Spaniards react. They start arresting people. Uh, but then Sumeroy and his uh, co-leaders really ratchet up the tension by killing a the local parish priest in Palapag. Um, Spanish, of course, very Catholic at this time. A large part of their colonization efforts involve attempting to convert the locals to Christianity. So killing the priest is a really direct way of registering your anti-Spaniard That's a sentiment. very polite way to say, yeah. fuck you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and unsurprisingly, with the death of this priest, uh, it really escalates from there. This kind of rebellion starts to spread throughout the region and onto other islands. Um, I found a roughly contemporary account of the uprising, but it was written by a Spaniard, so it is incredibly biased. <laughs> uh, I want to just tell you a little bit. So, for instance, this is how the Spanish author described the start of the uprising. Quote, as their councils were, were held in the excitement of wine, all readily approved this extravagant proposal. Immediately, the demon offered them for its execution the evilly inclined mind of a vile person named Sumeroy. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's intense. It's intense. Yeah, it's Fox uh, News of its day. Yeah, exactly. You know. Just absolutely blasting this guy. Uh, there was another account from the same time that said, there was an Indian named Sumeroy in the village of Palapag who was regarded as one of the best, although he was one of the very worst. <laughs> <laughs> and was, so mean girls. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. <laughs> And he was as evil as his father. And then they call his father a malignant sorcerer, which I think is a, <laughs> a pretty cool epithet. Um, so anyway, I read this account and I've tried to take the facts out of it and leave the bias behind. And so this is how it looked like things played out. Uh, the, the local men, the insurgents, were perhaps trying to get the attention of the Dutch to see if they would come to their aid against the Spanish. This would have been very bad for Spain. The Dutch are a big power at this time. Uh, but it didn't happen. The Dutch didn't join in. The insurgents killed priests and looted and burned churches. They got into fights with the Spanish army. The uprising is spreading throughout the Philippines. At one point, there are peace talks, and one of the captains of the Spanish army demands the head of Sumeroy from the men and says, like, this is a condition of the peace. And the men cut the head off a pig and send it <laughs> down the river to him, which is a pretty cool fuck you. <laughs> um the Spanish beg for reinforcements from Spain and uh, an armada is sent, uh, but it is full of, quote, coxcombs and foppish adventurers from Manila. Uh, define co coxcomb. <laughs> I, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> On a scale from one to foppish. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say more foppish. Okay, got it. Foppishy. Um, and then along with hundreds of uh, Lutaos, who are native Filipinos who had converted to Christianity and were on the side of the of the Spanish. The insurgents will, this is very important for you, given your penchant for military uh, history. The insurgents very intelligently take a, an entrenched, fortified position in the mountains. Makes right? Sense. Classic. It's, yeah, the Table of Palapag. And there's particularly one spot called the Eye of the Needle. That's this tiny oh. opening that only one man can fit through at a time. Clever. That leads to this very narrow path. So the Spaniards would have to kind of climb a mountain, get through the Eye of the Needle to get up to I the fort. I would say that's rife for caltrops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of, I think, things being thrown off of forts and things being attempted to thrown up into the oh, fort. I can picture this whole Home Alone esque. Yeah. Put some tar down, a single nail. Yeah, exactly. There's a hot iron that gets swung <laughs> from the treetops. Um, but the Spaniards, to their credit, uh, 
climb it in the middle of the night. They climb up the mountain. They are, uh, it is an incredibly heavy rain that they think is the providence of, of God, because even though it makes it harder for them to get up there, it obscures the visibility. And the sentinel who is positioned at the top of the mountain is gone when they get up there. And, and then this is great. In the words of this account, he comes back and, quote, perceived the bad effect of his carelessness. <laughs> <laughs> because an entire army. Because an entire army had shown up and had made it through the gap. Uh, that is a whoopsie. That's and they a had big, to go one by one. Yeah. So he was away for a long time. He was away time. for a long time. Yeah, it was a big old oopsie. Big whoopsie there. <laughs> Uh, things, as you can imagine, get very chaotic. Uh, there are a lot of clashes, but there's also kind of an immediate capitulation by some of the insurgents who just, they realize they're going to lose. The Spanish are much more equipped and even their high fortified position is not going to help them. Can you imagine the conversation with your manager after that happened? <laughs> and you're, tr- you're, you're trying like, to frame right, this. <laughs> right, John. So let me get this straight. <laughs> you're aware for how long? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to use this as a learning experience and I think I can really grow from this. And yeah. so next time when this happens i just know i can perceive the errors of my ways ahead of time 14 hours (laughs) (laughs) i know it sounds bad (laughs) um can you tell me about a time when you perceived the bad effect of your carelessness (laughs) fucking hell this guy yeah he is a big whoopsie (laughs) um and so things go from bad to worse for sumeroy and his and his men the insurgents actually turn on him they kill sumeroy they cut off his head and they give it to the Spanish, even though the Spanish had long since stopped yeah. asking for it. They, <laughs> is that because they thought they got it already? They just thought that he was, yeah, looked like a pig? Yeah, it's like <laughs> unclear. But anyway, now they got ahead. I think that's they be- better it. safe than sorry. It's belt and braces, isn't yeah, it? It's just, exactly. okay, like, yeah, exactly. You know, you, you've climbed the thing. You've taken advantage of the sentinel being gone. You may as well just finish the job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no word on what happened to his malignant sorcerer father. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As for his other confederates, Don Juan Ponce went into hiding and was eventually pardoned for for his role in the insurgency. But then he committed, quote, crimes that were so atrocious that they hanged him. Presumably crimes unrelated to this insurgency. So he did some bad stuff. Does it tell you what it is? Or nope. no, it, there's no record of this. No record, record of it uh, that I could find. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll look into it. It but sounds yeah, like he, he did was some hanged bad for stuff. this, but they just wanted to come up with an excuse. Yeah, exactly. He was pardoned. Yeah. Or he just did something way worse. Uh, and then the third guy, Don Pedro Camug, was basically absolved of his role in the uprising. He was able to prove that he wasn't the one who murdered the priest. And I guess they were just OK with the, all the other stuff he did. So he ended up living a very quiet life and became governor of his village. Uh, some of Sumeroy's lieutenants kept uh, the fighting up for a while, but they were eventually defeated. And in 1650, the rebellion ended. So it lasted about a year. Um And it was one of the kind of earliest rebellions against the Spanish. Like I said, there were many more after that uh, before eventually the Philippines, well, first became an American colony and then gained their independence. Uh, And just one final postscript here. uh, Sumeroy is commemorated in the scientific name of a species of gecko endemic to Samar, which is called, and I'm going to do a great job with this, Cyrtodactylus. Sumeroy. I nearly got that. I'm going to need you to say it one more time, though. Here it is. Cyrtodactylus Sumeroy. I know exactly what the correction is going to be next week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all the herpetologists can uh, can write in. Um, and that is the tale of Sumeroy and his rebellion. But before we go, I would like to know what species you would like to have named after you, both. Maybe like some sort of flesh-eating bacteria for Will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that took a turn. I thought you were going to oh, say for it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. no. I'd great. be like um, flesh promoting bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> Those are really pro flesh bacteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like yeah. Botox or something. Yeah. Straight up Botox. Is something nice. that, you know, all, all the celebrities want. That's near really them. good. No objections from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. That's uh, 1649 in the Philippines. Okay, so for my topic this week, uh, as regular listeners will know, I've been struggling so far on this series <laughs> to talk about anything other than major British battles over the yeah. future of Britishness and the yeah. Crown, yeah. which I accept is 
a somewhat limited take on the topic of history, which... <laughs> there are a few other things, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's fairly broad, and I've been keeping it reasonably narrow so far. So in an effort to wean myself off battles involving at least one British king, <laughs> uh, I am talking today about battles involving other kings. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, so this is going to be our first sequel as well, Ooh. because I'm going to tell the story about the Mughal-Safavid War. Oh. The Safavids are back again. Our favourite friends. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. And and uh, as many listeners uh, might know, if they listen to the first episode yeah. of first our episode, series, yeah. Yeah. then they might recognise uh, that Abbas II, who will fe- feature in the story I'm about to tell, is the son of Shah Safi, okay. who Anna told us about. That right? Yes. Yeah, yep. So then Abbas II would be the great grandson of Abbas I or Abbas yep. the Great. Sure. And <laughs> <laughs> but if, I guess if you haven't listened to that one, you might want to go back at some point and listen to it, but not yet. And uh, so for those who haven't listened to that episode, the Safavids are the ruling group in modern day Iran at the time. And the Mughals were a large empire founded in what is now modern day Uzbekistan uh, by Babur in 1526. And they went on to rule what is now India and Bangladesh and Pakistan and bits of Afghanistan and some of the adjacent territories. And this war was mainly about the southern Afghan city of Kandahar, which the Safavids had had a claim over for a very long time. And so on the 4th of April, 1648, so the year before, um, Shah Abbas uh, II marched from Isfahan, which is kind of in, which is in Iran, on day Iran, uh, with about 40,000 troops. Ooh, that is a lot. Which is quite a lot yeah. for that time. Yeah. And first he went over and captured Bost, which is modern-day Lashkagar, or, or is the ancient city that wasn't, that's in modern-day Lashkagar. And then he laid siege to Kandahar at, on the 28th of December of that year. So this is right at the end of the preceding year. And captured it embarrassingly easily mm. after a very brief siege on oh, the 22nd yeah. of February in 1649. There 40,000 of them. Yeah. I mean, right. You know, that's not that. I wouldn't be embarrassed if I was the, you know, head yeah. honcho of Kandahar. Like, I couldn't do anything. If 40,000 troops marched and caught me off guard in my house, I might, I, I might, even I <laughs> might only hold out for five, six, seven months. <laughs> <laughs> Is that with or without the help of your uh, eponymous flesh eating bacteria? <laughs> Uh, biological warfare is no no joke at will yeah <laughs> they're quite right yeah <laughs> treaties for that kind of thing uh and the uh and the and the the short duration of the siege kind of shows how vulnerable the Mughals have become in that area. And they've, they've frankly been coasting for quite a while. And so <laughs> they, they were understandably pretty pissed. They were a proud uh, people themselves. And so they did what any self-respecting empire attempts to do at some point, which is Wasting time mucking about in Kandahar. <laughs> <laughs> there is a resonance of truth that are echoing uh, yeah. it, I, but I raise can't your think hand why. If you've been there, <laughs> <laughs> and so and so they tr- they tried to retake the place three times, and I'm just going to talk you through the very brief highlights of the three sieges now. So siege one, they wanted to go back to Kandahar, and they knew that the Safavids had tried with 40,000 troops. So they tried with, guess how many? 40,000 and one. (laughs) I know the answer is going to be much less than (laughs) 40,000, but I would not want to do without less than 60,000. Okay, the answer is 50,000 troops. Oh, Oh, okay, 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 okay. And they turned up and tried to fight the Safavids, which they mostly did on the outskirts of the city. So for many months, they were fighting the Safavids, not inside the city where they could take lots of casualties and not doing a traditional siege, but fighting in kind of open pitch battles on the outside of the city. And ultimately, the weather was against them and logistics mainly were against them as well. And so they gave up and went home. And they were still extremely embarrassed by this whole thing and they'd tried to retake the place and failed. So they came back for attempt number two. Attempt two, here we go. (laughs) 40,000 and two. So in their second attempt, they come back three years later now. Okay. So, so 80, I'm not sure if this is allowed on the date, dates wise, but three years later. And, and and can you guess this time what they tried to do differently? So the last problems they had were weather, logistics. Well, the last time kind of they didn't succeed. So I'm hoping that they tried to succeed this time. If it was weather and logistics, I'm going to say they had umbrellas and bread. Yeah. Umbrellas and bread. Uh, I'm going to say that they did nothing different. <laughs> nothing they different. Nothing. <laughs> umbrellas and bread and nothing different. So they, in fact, what they did was the following. They thought that something that might help them might be more firepower. Yep. Yep. Uh, because it turns out 
it helps if you can blast your way through the city walls to get into the city, which is something they hadn't they'd failed to do last time. So this time they went for bigger cannons. Yay! Yay. Good, good and news. they also had problems with with logistics because some of their animals were the wrong kind of animal the first time. So this time, camels Camel. instead oh, yeah, of yeah, yeah. rabbits. <laughs> The pack rabbits are complaining. (laughs) They really regret it. They got a bulk deal on the pack rabbits. (laughs) And it seems so, it's like such a good deal at the time. But you know what? In the end, false economy. Yeah, yeah. A thousand camels or 500,000 pack rabbits. You would have thought at that volume. Yeah, it would make sense. I mean, genuinely, that's a good question though. A thousand camels or 500,000 rabbits. So hang on, if you've got saddlebags on the rabbits, what? <laughs> tiny, how many grams? How many grams like do you get? Two pairs per rabbit. I think you could get maybe five hundred grams per saddlebag. So say sorry, sorry, on both grams. sides of the rabbit, yeah, or two hundred fifty, two hundred fifty. Yeah, but trying to corral them in the same direction. I know we're going off topic here, no, but no, this no, is this very is, important. This is very important. Um, that trying to corral five hundred thousand rabbits must be thankless whereas camels just plod along yeah. and you can drag them by a rope that's 500,000 bits of rope 500,000 rabbit tamers I suppose maybe you could do <laughs> no yeah it's one to one yes. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> one rabbit per had, tamer only, okay so they only had 50,000 troops yeah. right so that's that's one to ten yeah, yeah. right um each man, each has, man one, has ten rabbits. Has supporting ten rabbits, him, yeah. right? And, and each rabbit has one man in terms of water alone you're gonna need what five liters a day for the rabbits. For for yourself, the rabbits, I'm assuming, are probably a <laughs> litre itself. and they, So you're going to be carrying, like, hundreds of litres of water on the back of rabbit. I just don't. Yeah, no one really actually thinks about supply chain when they bring 500,000 <laughs> rabbits to war. I, I think one just... of the issues is also that they struggled then, during this particular mm. attempt, to have anything transported to the siege location that was larger than a clementine. <laughs> and, 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 Throw more clementines at them, boys! <laughs> And they thought that wouldn't be an issue because no. of the volume thing, but yeah, in the of end, course. didn't really work out. So that was the siege. That was attempt number two, and that was kind of it. That's all they tried. Didn't work. And then the third <laughs> attempt. <laughs> third attempt. There's one theme that characterizes the third attempt. Can you guess the theme? Failure. I think the theme was having a can-do attitude. <laughs> Incorrect, and got it. <laughs> the theme was good old-fashioned military incompetence. <laughs> and so that was it. The Safavids basically turned up with 40,000 people, walked straight into this city, and the Mughals couldn't be bothered to get their act together to retake it and went through a very uh, costly lessons learned process on rabbit logistics. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> and, and as far as I'm aware, I think... Did it's... they have the guy that was guarding the, the, the keyhole <laughs> there as well? Yeah, exactly. The, the Filipino guy who <laughs> saw the error of his ways. That's where he'd gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Next job. Your references? Oh, I don't have any. Don't, don't call them. No <laughs> one checks references these yeah. days. Yeah, you worked there for 20 years, but you don't want us to call them? Suspicious, <laughs> but you're hired. <laughs> And and as and as far, as far as I know, there's been peace and a total <laughs> lack of <laughs> any eventful yeah. <laughs> incidents in no that area further. ever yeah. since. In and I think India, the Safavids, Iran, Kandahar, any of the places we've talked about. So the Safavids still rule in Kandahar. <laughs> they do, they do. And that is, it's, With it's the weight of millions of rabbits on yeah. their size, tactical rabbits. Exactly right. And <laughs> it's quite a lovely place if everyone wants to go to visit yeah, and sure. uh, enjoy Safavid rule. I would like to answer my own question and say that I would like to have a species of tactical rabbit named after me. <laughs> but these are, no, you, you've got several types, right? So these these are logistic rabbit rabbits. Logistic rabbits. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The so, commander so, rabbits are the ones you yeah, really you're talking. Yeah, you're yeah. talking about commander attack rabbits. And, uh, rabbits with like little eye black under their yeah, eyes yeah, yeah. and like yeah. <laughs> like camouflage wrapped around oh, yeah. their ears. Yeah. And they don't have they don't have saddlebags. They're no, not, they're not, not. solid with such no, in, no, like yeah. Yeah. lowly. Lightweight, like, move fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, tiny little daggers. Oh my God. God, wow. this is all I want in the world. Um, do we need to discuss anything else about this year? Does anyone need to discuss ever again about this year? No, I had tactical rabbits on my list and we have covered it. So I think we're good on 1649. Nailed it. my little commando rabbits uh (laughs) thanks for joining us that is i think we can all agree everything you'd ever need to know about the year 1649 if you have questions or comments you can find us on twitter or visit our website randomlygeneratedhistory.com cool and as ever we are now going to choose our next year so will 
please, can you boot up the random number generator and put us out of our misery? Yeah, we'll do. It is firing up as I speak. And the next year is 851. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's a really... Okay. 851. I can't imagine a lot happened. No. Really? They're just waiting. Is that Dark Ages still? Well, I mean, we got Charlemagne in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. I do love a bit of Charlemagne. Love a little bit of Charlemagne. Which, statistically, how likely is it that we would have got the years we've got? I mean, is it... I know. It's a narrow band. Literally 100% because we got them. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Mr. Mr. Maths. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, This is not the randomly generated maths podcast. But our year... Yeah, we've gone from... Our span is 652 to 1649. So a thousand year span out of a 3000 year right. window. Yeah, we've not... Have we, yeah. we've not That's quite unlikely. Yet. Okay, I know, I know. No, I've been holding out for like 1986. <laughs> <laughs> the year of your birth. Yeah, exactly. I'm very excited about that. Well, I'm excited for 851. Yeah, we'll see when we get there. 